So, um, and, and you're going to find out very quickly that the reason I just did that little history about family is because shalom has everything to do with our relationships, um, primarily and first and foremost with family. For Biola folks, if you were um, at After Dark on Wednesday night, you heard me talk about the prodigal son as a story to kind of undo dysfunction in families and reclaim what God intends for families. So there's a couple more seats, so d don't, don't, don't hesitate to come on in. Um, so uh, <clears throat> what's an iceberg doing up there on a seminar on Shalom, right? This is an interesting photo. It was shot in the waters off of Newfoundland. Come on in, uh, grab a, st uh, there's a seat here. And somebody can take the tall one, because I won't be sitting, if you want. Um, so I'll just put this off to the side. So this, this photo was shot off the, the coast of Newfoundland uh, by a diver on a very calm day. And um, uh, experts in iceberg science, whatever term that is, uh, estimate there's about 100,000 tons of ice above the water and there's about 800,000 tons of ice below the water. Um, and the captain of the Titanic forgot about what was under the water, right? So what we're gonna do is go beneath the water today. We're gonna talk about this biblical term, shalom, often gets translated as peace. So when you hear the word peace, what comes to your mind? First thing that comes to your mind. What does peace mean? Rest. Okay, rest, okay. Letting our bodies recuperate. All right, so there was some peace that came to us as we rested last night. Some of us more than others. Okay, uh, what else? Clear conscience. Hmm? Clear conscience. Clear conscience, yeah. We don't have to worry about our past because, you know, there, there's no ghost in the closet, right? Okay, good. Freedom from disturbance. Freedom from? Freedom from disturbance. Okay, freedom, freedom from disturbance. Okay, that could be internal. Right? Uh, I, I feel settled in my spirit. That could be external. There's no conflict between peoples. Okay, good. Um, harmony with other people. And ah, okay. Harmony. Great term. We're going to talk about harmony in, in just, just a minute. The Cherokee term for harmony is dohi. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a moment. So you can see there's a lot of ideas that, that, are, that, that are out there. All right? What we're gonna do is dive below the surface and here's why it's important. If I ask you, how many times does the word love show up in your English Bible? What would you guess? A lot. That, that's a great, that, that's a, you're right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. It shows up a lot. How many times? Go ahead. No pain, no gain, nothing ventured, nothing lost. 200. 200, let's go higher. Uh, let's go lower. 500. Okay, you're close. Go a little higher. Huh? 550. 550. You are, you, there you go, all right? That guy gets a free lunch for the rest of his life, all right? <laughs> in the NIV concordance, which compiles the translations in the New International Version exactly 550 times, how many times do, do, does the forms of the word peace show up? 500. Keep going. 550. Keep going. 525? No, no, keep. Oh, okay, 575. Lower. 551. 551, all right? <laughs> okay. Different forms of the Hebrew term shalom and Greek erene show up 551 times. In other words, shalom, peace, is as frequent as love, which means it's just as important. Why then, if you go to the top 50 commentaries on or top 50 textbooks on biblical theology that were written over the last 50 years the top 20 I'm sorry the top 25 textbooks on biblical theology over the last 25 years love shows up in the index of every one of those books and peace only shows up in the index of two of those books so I'm on a quest to literally find the missing piece. It's not missing from the Bible. What's missing is 
our perception of what the Bible has to teach about the significance of shalom. And because we have ignored this term and not lived out its implications, we are not all that God wants us to be. The church is not what God wants it to be. And that means the world is really messed up. So I want to begin with a confession and apology. I'm 62 years old. 40 years ago, I sat where you're sitting right now. And we had dreams and visions about the world that we wanted to create. And I look now at the world that my generation is handing, handing to you, and I grieve. What a mess we have made. And we don't have time to fix it. The clock's running out on us. So we are handing you this horrific mess that we've created, and I'm sorry to you. Now, my challenge to you is, I've got four grandkids. By the summer, I'll have six under the age of five. My challenge is, you create the world that I desperately want my grandkids and your family members to live into. You go live into that world, and we're going to talk about that as we go along. So underneath the surface, that's where we're going. We're going to take a deep dive, and we're going to move really fast. So. Somebody said after one of these seminars, last time I spoke at the score was, you should have warned us to fasten our seatbelts and put on our crash helmets. We're going to move fast now. Here we go. OK? Come on in. You probably won't be able to see much there, so you might have to, might have to move around a little bit. OK, so peace on earth. We need it now. Shalom as God's gift and our calling. Shalom is God's gift and our calling. So the first line in the first book of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the first line in the first of the movies, the world is changed. I feel it in the air. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air. Much, much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. That's a prophetic line. Because if we buy the materialistic worldview, that we are nothing more than the chance collisions of our atoms. If, that's, if all we are is matter, it becomes virtually impossible to explain why it is that every one of us in, a heart, in our hearts has this longing for something better. I've traveled through the Middle East, and I've, I've talked with Muslim imams. I've been to the death camps that the Third Reich created in Germany and gone with students there. I spend a lot of time in Central America. I was in Costa Rica in January. I'll be back in Nicaragua uh, next month. And everywhere I go, no matter what language, what culture, what religion, there's a longing in the hearts of every human person. The way things are are not the way things are supposed to be. Where do we get that long? Where do we get the sense? There's something about the way it's supposed to be, and we're not there now. The answer is this. We're going to discover in the next hour that shalom has been planted in every one of our hearts by the Creator. And because we're not living in shalom and our world's not in shalom, we long for it. We desperately desire it. So Galadriel was right, a great prophetic word. So here we go. Uh, I've spoken in chapel here three times over the last 48 hours, and people have said, so how do you define this word shalom? I said, I'm not interested in definitions. I'm interested in descriptions. Definitions say, well, this one word means these three words in this language. That's not good enough. You need a whole paragraph to describe shalom. Actually, you need a whole Bible to get the full view of it. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Old Testament prophets call shalom. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight, a rich state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom God del delights. Cornelius Plantiga is on the faculty at Calvin. That comes from the, the book um, called Engaging God's World. Engaging God's World. Great little book on Shalom. Okay, so in Hebrew, 
Shalom can be described as flourishing, wholeness, perfection of God's creation, prosperity, and peace. It can mean all those things. My paraphrase is, shalom is the way things are supposed to be. And then the question comes, well, who gets to say how things are supposed to be? Politicians and governments and armies? And my answer is, the Creator gets to say the way things are supposed to be. That's where we're going to start. That's what we're going to work on. So, uh, um, my goal is to make you good Hebrew and Greek scholars in the next hour. So here's how, here's how, uh, sh here's how Hebrew words form. They always have three consonants as the root. So actually there's one consonant that in English we have to use two for. We have to use SH and then L and then M. That's the root. And then, depending upon what you do with the vowels you put in, off of the same root, you can create nouns and verbs and adjectives. It's a great linguistic tool. Our language, which comes out of Western society, which is deeply influenced by Platonic dualism, we're interested in distinctions between words. What's the differentiation? And that's important. I want my surgeon to know the difference between my liver and my brain. <laughs> but in Hebrew, the worldview is one of which everything starts with asking this question, how is everything connected to everything else? And when we start with that then, we build that into the language. So, we end up with shalom as a noun, and that's what gets translated as flourishing, wholeness, peace. But then if you put in an A and an E here, you've made a verb, which means to go do shalom, live it out. It also means that when we're in a condition of brokenness, to shalem, S-H-A-L-E-M, to shalem means to go back and make right what is broken. Now you can see how one root starts to explode in terms of its implications. And you can also use adjectives. Interesting, you can also make this into a name. We call the king that comes after King David, Solomon. His actual name is, in Hebrew, is Shalemo. The king of Shalom, ruling over the city of Shalom, Yerushalem. And then we have to ask the question, so how did it work out under King Solomon's rule? We're going to come to that. So, this shows up about 225 times as a noun, and there's the frequency. So one of the things that's interesting to, to do is to pay attention to where it is most frequent, and you can see the prophets love this word, 78 times in the prophets. But then here's this verb, shalem to repay in full, to make restitution, to pay back, to restore, to make peace, to fulfill, to bring to completion, to accomplish, shows up 29 times in the Pentateuch, very important in terms of context, and 27 times in the prophets, and then scattered throughout the rest. The noun, which can mean fellowship offering or peace offering, shows up 87 times. One of the great offerings in the in, in the progression of sacrifices that is articulated in Leviticus and, Numer and Deuteronomy is that when everything is right, then we bring before God the shalem, the peace offering. It's a statement, we're right with each other. I mean, we're right with you, God. We're right with each other. We're right with the creation. Shows up as an adjective, and it shows up as a name. So the total of all those appearances is about 290 times. Now, we go to the New Testament, and the, noun sh the, the, the Greek noun, erene, is the noun that is used to translate shalom. We know that because when the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, these are the words that are used to pick up all those shalem roots. 92 times it shows up, mostly as a noun, a few times as a verb, to restore relationship, wholeness, healing, and peace. So there's the summary. Oh, I said 551, sorry, 556, excuse me. 
And, and I, what I want to do is give you some references along the way. So I've mentioned Engaging God's World, planting his book. Here's another great one, Willard Swartley, Covenant of Peace, Finding the Missing Peace in the New Testament. Swartley really works on the New Testament places where this word erine and its roots um, uh, or its equivalents also show up. Okay, so I helped start a mountaineering program in Colorado uh, back in the 1970s. Nobody had ever been uh, in this area where we're going to start taking high school kids up in the, the Sangre de Cristo section of the Rockies. We're going to climb some 14,000 foot peaks and all we had were maps, topographical maps. This was long before GPS. And, and what we had to do to get to the, the trailhead, there were four trails that would lead to different 14,000 foot peaks. Storm King and Guardian. And the trailheads all started at exactly the same point. And we had maps, but there were no signs. So what our guides had to do was to take that map and go down the trail far enough to know that the map that they were holding was actually the trail that they were on. In other words, you had to make sure that you were starting at the right place. Because if you didn't start at the right place, it didn't make any difference what map you had in your hands. If the map didn't match the trail, you were lost from the beginning. And that was dangerous because you were leading the people in the places that you thought you knew where you were going. But in fact, you were completely lost. Now, I think that's what's happened theologically with the evangelical church. Because the evangelical church in the United States has not started where the Bible starts to address the nature of what's God up to, we're lost. So if the primary issue is how do individual souls get saved for heaven, Genesis 1 and 2 is irrelevant. So where do we start? Genesis 3, we're lost, we're depraved. You know, in the great Presbyterian tradition, total depravity. Really? I go back and I read Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We're created in God's image. And, and, and I believe that line, God don't make no junk. Total depravity? Really? See, if we, if we start with ourselves, we're starting at the wrong place. And from then on, we are lost, even though we've got the Bible in our hands. We got a great map, but we've not started at the right place. So what I'm urging is, that we go back and we start where the Hebrew people started with the story of creation. And if we get the story of creation embedded in our hearts, then the trajectory becomes very clear. And that's what I want to lay out in the next few minutes. So what does it take to have shalom? I want to put before you, there are five elements that God creates. This is not our idea. This is what God did in creation. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first thing God does is the ordering of creation. On days one and three, God separates everything. Skies from the waters, waters from the land, everything's being put in its proper place. And then on days four through six, God fills the creation. So as an illustration, somebody took some chemicals, some plastics, made it into kind of an ooze and created this water bottle, right? It's formed. There I am, I'm holding a water bottle. But until it is filled with water and until I am drinking it, it's not fulfilling its intended purpose. So separation and forming has to take place first and then God fills what God has formed. Order. Now, we don't need to look far to understand what happens when the order of creation is broken. Crazy typhoons in the Philippines. We had a couple of our alums actually sit through the epicenter of that. Prayed for them during that typhoon. Hurricane Sandy sweeps down and literally floods the lower section of Manhattan in New York City when disorder breaks out in the creation, we've got chaos and people suffer. 
The next thing God does is to create humanity. Humankind created in God's image, the famous piece from the Sistine Chapel, so close to the nature of God and yet not quite divine. Let us make Adam in our image. In the image of God, let us make humankind. We are created for relationships because there's something about the nature of this created God that is also relational. Then God creates responsibility. God imparts human stewardship into creation. So in 128, God says, now what I want you to do is to take care of the creation, to have dominion and to rule. The two Hebrew terms that are used can imply asserting uh, influence for the sake of a, an intended purpose, all right? I can dominate and rule the rental car that I rented at, at the airport the other day. I have power over that when I'm in that vehicle. But my role is to utilize that vehicle for its intended purpose so it gets me to where I'm going to go. There are awful Christian interpretations of Genesis 128 have dominion and rule which assert that humanity can just do whatever we want. No, we can't. We've done it. And how are we doing? How's the creation doing? So in 215, there are two other terms after the man is created in the second narrative. The first term is abad in Hebrew. It means literally to serve the earth. And the second term is shamar. And you know what shamar refers to in terms of an image? It is what newborn parents do, I mean, what, what parents do with their newborn babies. You hover over that child. I can't wait to hold, I, 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 know, I know there's two boys coming, okay? I mean, the first thing I do, the first time I've held every one of my grandkids, and I'll do it again in April and May, I want that child to look in my eyes. I want, I want to see that child's eyes. Shamar. God says, you work the earth like a parent works with a newborn child. Now, there's awful abuse that goes on, and that's evil. But that's not what God intends when children are born into the world. What God intends is that the parents who bring that child into the world do everything necessary as someone or some group of people has done in your life to nourish and flourish your lives. That's what we are supposed to do with the creation. And so, so of course, the, the measure of how parents are doing is you look at the kids, right? How are the kids doing? So when Maasai herdsmen walk by each other between villages out in the bush in rural Kenya, it's not, yo, it's not hi. You know the question they ask each other? How are the children doing? It's a question of flourishing. If the children are suffering, that means there's famine or drought. That mean the, means, the, means the herd is not producing. If the statement is the children are well, there's shalom in that village. So the measure of, of the stewardship is in the outcome. Is life being produced or is it being diminished? The fourth element is beauty, art. God saw everything that God made and behold, it was tov meod. It was spectacularly beautiful. And the fifth element, somebody already mentioned this earlier, is the rhythm. Six days of work, and seventh day, Sabbath rest. There was evening and there was morning, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, seventh day, rest. And then what gets embedded into Israel? A seventh year rest, let the land rest. We call that the Sabbath year. And then what gets embedded seven times, seven years? A jubilee year, let the land rest every 50th year. Rest is embedded into Israel. And you know, you, go, you listen to the prophets, and one of the reasons Israel was sent into exile is that they never let the land rest. They never celebrated a sabbatical or a jubilee year. And it was to their detriment. Now we've got these little 
machines that you carry around in your, there's one right there, sitting right in front of you, all right? Technology has eliminated the rhythm of day and night. Anybody, anytime, anywhere can have access to you and you vice versa. And I love that I can FaceTime my grandkids and see them on that machine. But I am in danger of allowing that machine to rob me of the biblically ordained rest that God intends for me. Rest seventh day. Rest seventh year. Jubilee, let the land rest, set everything back to its original order. There's the five elements of creation. Order, relationships, responsibility, beauty, and art. We're not even out of Genesis 1 yet. I promise you we're going to get to the end of Revelation in the next 40 minutes, so we're going to have to pick up the pace. I've lingered here because these are the five elements of shalom. And when Jesus shows up, as we're going to see in a few minutes, his ministry is about re resetting every one of these elements. So here's order. Just work through these real quickly. And there, there's the crescendo of God's creation, humanity created in God's image. There's shalom relationships. The reason the woman is created in Genesis chapter 2 is because God declares for the first time in all of God's creative activity, something is not good. And you know what's not good? Isolation, being alone. We talked about this yesterday in the student luncheon. Here's the problem. Western society is built on platonic dualism, which divides everything into spiritual and material. One of the end products of that is Descartes' famous maxim, I think, therefore I am. Listen to that statement. Because I have the ability to cognitively work in my head, therefore I exist. Existence is all about me internally without any concern for how I'm related to anybody else. In the Hebrew scriptures, our existence is tied to our relationship with God and each other. That's where we start, not with the isolated individual. So God, God solves this problem and God says, I'm gonna make a helper for you, individual, isolated man. The Hebrew term is Eitzer. Shows up 40 times in the Old Testament. Most frequently, this term is, refers to God. An Eitzer is someone who intervenes to solve someone else's problem that person in need of help cannot fix alone. A helper is not a slave. Amen. All right? The Eitzer solves the problem of Adam's isolation. And if we started here with our understanding of male-female relationships in the Christian church, things would be a lot different. Now, this Acer is intended to correspond to, to be equivalent to. Those are the two Hebrew terms. So, when the woman is brought forth, listen to what the man says. Finally, or at last, I've seen what I've been longing for. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. There is correspondence. That's what the man celebrates. Wow, this woman is like me. We can be in relationship now. Even the terminology, we do it in English. Man and woman, in Hebrew, they do the same thing. Ish, to refer to the individual man. Isha, to refer to the individual woman. Can you see over there? Or do you want to move over further? Don't worry about messing up the room, that's fine. And then stewardship, be fruitful and multiply. And here's the four terms I just talked about. Have dominion and subdue the earth. That's Genesis 1.28. Then abad, to work or to serve. Shamar, to keep it, to watch over, to preserve. I love this image of literally the hand of the creator handing to humanity the cosmos, the world, like a delicate egg. Handle gently. Then shalom, beauty. God saw everything that God had made, and it was very good. Seven times the word 
tov, which refers to uh, goodness, is used in Genesis chapter 1, the seventh time, tov meod, this under, uh, overflowing sense of goodness, just like the waterfalls at Victoria Falls in Africa. In other words, the goodness is meant to just keep flowing. This is not a perfect blueprint. This is flourishing life that just keeps developing. And then rhythm. God's enjoyment of finished creation, God sets apart the seventh day and makes it holy because on that day, God created. Okay. Now, all of what God does addresses the issue in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. The earth was formless and empty and darkness hovered over the creation. The Hebrew words are tohu, bohu, and hoshek. So order, relationships, stewardship, beauty, rhythm are all elements that deal with the issue of chaos. All right? Now in Hebrew, we're going to see that the antithesis of shalom is the Hebrew word ra. Shows up 310 times. Often gets translated evil. Okay? But embedded in the idea of that word is a sense that when things are not functioning according to God's creation intent, what we get is chaos. Okay? We talk about evil as, as moral sin, and it certainly is that. But what it does to the harmony of the web of all of creation is it creates chaos. <clears throat> so if you don't get enough sleep, you wake up the next morning, you feel some of that chaos. Stomach's a little queasy, a little bit of a headache, no energy. Now, you didn't sin because you didn't sleep enough, but our body has this constant feedback loop of telling us whether we are in shalom or not. The whole creation order, the ecosystem has a constant feedback loop. So, <clears throat> when we live in shalom, we move away from chaos. <clears throat> when, we, when we somehow violate God's shalom intentions, we end up with brokenness. So, the webbing together of God and humans and all creation and fulfillment and delight is shalom. So here's what the web looks like. When God is at the center. And these are all words that my students have given me to help us think about what happens when we are living in shalom. Now, you mentioned the word harmony a, a moment ago. Let me, re let me refer you to another good book from Randy Woodley, who's on the faculty at George Fox Seminary. Randy is Cherokee. And uh, he's just he's finished his dissertation years ago. That dissertation has now been published. The name of the book is Shalom and the Community of Creation. And what Randy has done is interviewed uh, tribal leaders from all kinds of different tribes, not just in the United States, but indigenous peoples all over the world. And what he's found is that every tribe has embedded within it this sense of harmony, dohi in Cherokee. Okay. Well, where does that come from? There it is, right? when we are living in harmony with God as the central focus, in the center of, the, of all the action, that's what we get. We get harmony, we get shalom, dohi, paz in espanol, salam in Arabic. But of course, we don't stay there long, do we? Keep all that in your mind now, don't forget it. Now we go to the brokenness of shalom. So, in five verses, what God has created in two chapters get undone in five verses. Questioning, distorting, denying, disobeying God's word. Did God say? Genesis 3.1. The distortion of the woman. Don't eat it, don't touch it. No, that wasn't in there. When you do, you're going to die. The response, oh, no, 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 you won't die. 
denying God's word. And then disobeying. We can do that calculation in our brains faster than the fastest computers can compute calculation. We are really good at that sequence. That's called sin. And it all starts with calling into question the sovereign word of the one who spoke the universe into existence. And when we do that, everything gets messed up. We have broken relationships, we have violence and murder, we've got universal judgment, we've got universal dispersion. By Genesis 11, things are really not the way they're supposed to be. <clears throat> Between humanity and God, all messed up. Between us and each other, the murder of one brother by the other. Brokenness in relationship to creation. The driving away from the garden in the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> Think at what a tremendous ego boost. This is another one of Randy's books called Living in Color, which I also commend to you. I used to use Living in Color as the first book in my Shalom course. Now I use his um, Shalom, the Community of Creation as the first book. Think of what a tremendous ego boost it would be if everyone else were just like us. Tower of Babel, let us build a tower into the heavens to make a name for ourselves. We're going to be like God. That's what, what, that's what Satan promised. It's what the serpent dangled before the woman. You'll be like God, knowing good. Well, they already knew good, tov, and evil. You can only be like God if you know evil. And evil is what God never intended for the creation to know. Humanity bought the lie, and now we want to build a tower into the heavens, and we want everybody to be just like us. The sin of ethnocentrism. And so cultures and peoples and societies have been imposing what they think things ought to be upon others. And it's been going on down through the ages. So what does God do? God disperses the nations and gives them different tongues to try and keep people from imposing this sort of egocentric power on other people. Tower of Babel was a protection against ego and ethnocentrism. That's what, that's what it was. And somehow we learned to overcome that. So here's what happens when the creation gets all messed up. We break the web. And really what we do is we move God from the center to the periphery, and we move ourselves into the center. That's the essence of what happens to the Shalom web. So we, we then practice exclusion, us and them. This comes from Miroslav Volf, exclusion and embrace. When people are not like us, we either eliminate them by means of genocide, First Nations in America, so many millions of people during the Holocaust under the Third Reich, or we assimilate, become like us, or we dominate, or we simply abandon people. We don't give a rip about them. It does not affect us. One of my good friends, Tom Getman, worked with Senator Hatfield in, um, uh, who was a senator from Oregon, and they worked together um, to try and get U.S. sanctions voted in against South African apartheid. And, and through that, Tom became very good friends with <coughs> Bishop Tutu. And because Tom was so involved in um, African affairs, he became very aware in the late 1980s of all the problems that were breaking out in the southern Sudan. And he repeatedly went to the State Department and said, we have got to deal with this. 
if we deal with this now, there's a chance that these people's lives can be better and different. And the repeated response was, the U.S. has no interest in southern Sudan. That was 25 years ago. Oh yeah? We sure do now. Where millions of people are suffering as a result of religious war that is brought to a boiling point because of the lust for oil. So the sin of exclusion gets expressed in various ways. Now, in Scripture, we are not given the option to look at anyone as the outsider, to ignore them, because everyone is created in God's image. And so another term that I want you to walk away from this morning <clears throat> is this. The Hebrew term ger talks about the alien, the outsider. The plural, if you want to make a plural of in English, we add an S to the word, okay, cup, cups. In Hebrew, you add I-M, and that makes it plural. Gerim is the term. It shows up 92 times in a variety of different settings, in a variety of different forms. What does the Lord God ask of you? To walk in God's ways, to love God and serve God, to observe God's commands, to show no partiality, to defend the fatherless, that would be the orphan, the widow and to love the Gedim. That tri triad of terms, the orphan, the widow, and the Gedim show up dozens and dozens and dozens of times together throughout the Old Testament. And it makes perfect sense because those are the three most powerless groups of people in the culture. And so God says, I'm going to take a look at the edges of your culture to those who do not have any power to make life for themselves. Are you committed to them and caring for them? You are to love the Gerim. Why? Because you were Gerim in Egypt. That's how the Egyptians looked at you for 400 years. <coughs> the outsider, the alien, the unwelcome, but we sure will take your labor. So, because we want to be like God, what that does is it distorts our relationship with others. And what we're going to find then is that Scripture is going to be about this renewing things. So, the key passage where this term Gedim shows up, <clears throat> is in Numbers chapter 15, which, by the way, is interestingly the place where Moses is describing the ritual of confessing sin and receiving atonement for sin. And in that chapter, the word gerim shows up seven times. This atonement, this salvation, this forgiveness that God is extending to you through the ritual of sacrifice, it's not just for you. It's also for those who ethnically are different than you, but who are abiding with you in your land. They are in your community. And the reason everyone gets forgiven is because in God's view, what we do to each other in the end is, in Hebrew, shagah, it's unintentional sin. In other words, we don't know what we're doing. Now that ought to catch your memory banks if you have read anything of the story of the death of Jesus. Because Jesus quotes shagah, unintentional sin from the cross. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And as I've been writing my book on Shalom, this was the place that was the tripwire for me. I can remember taking a commentary and literally throwing it against the wall, thinking, this is crazy. Jesus, what do you mean they didn't know what they were doing? The Sanhedrin wanted to murder you as far back as chapter 5, verse 18. They decided your fate way back at the beginning of John's gospel. They didn't know what they were doing. Of course they did. 
Pilate and the Romans? Of course they did. The crowds crying, crucify him? Everybody knew exactly what they were doing. And they got what they wanted, your murder. But the divine perspective was, everybody's perception was so polluted, so distorted by Ra, by evil, that in fact, nobody truly understood what was going on. Unintentional sin. So, we, we are all part of evangelical institutions, and we champion the doctrine of atonement, right? If we listen to the doctrine of atonement, if we believe that Jesus died for our sins, if we take Jesus' words literally and understand the Old Testament background, that has enormous implications when, when that gets linked to Numbers 15 in terms of our relationships with each other. And there's the biblical evidence. So look who gets included. Roman centurion, the executioner, the one who's responsible to Pilate to make sure Jesus ended up dead, is the first one to confess Jesus' true identity. This man was the Son of God. Really? Wow. What, what turned the centurion? He'd never heard a Jew who he had murdered ever pray a prayer of forgiveness for him. Jesus is reaching back to this great tradition of the Gedim and saying, you are Gedim, and in the mercy of God, you also will be forgiven. So we move ahead to Solomon. Saul, and then David, and then Solomon, the third king of the United Kingdom. You go back and you read 1 Samuel chapter 8, where the elders come to Samuel and they want a king. And God tells Samuel, go ahead and give him a king, but warn him first. Here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a military economy. Because what, what do kings need? They need armies. You're going to get a draft. Your sons are going to be put in the army. Your daughters are going to be those who will cook for the soldiers. You need to develop a government bureaucracy to maintain this whole military industrial complex. The king will require you to give 10% to the government and 10% to the king. Oh, and by the way, the king can take anything he wants, anytime he wants from any of you. And the seventh warning, understand that if you want a king, in the end, you're going to be slaves. The king will enslave you. You really want to go back to Egyptian captivity with a king? You sing... In your Psalms, Yahweh Malak, the Lord reigns, God is king. So who is king here? Is it a human person or do you believe the one who created you and saved you from Egyptian bondage is king? Who are you going to believe? They chose the human king. Solomon's got a big idea. I'm going to build a temple and a palace for God. Really? Well, go right ahead and do that, Solomon. And he does, even though he was warned. To get the temple built, he had to impose harsh taxation on his people and he had to find a labor force. He rounded up over 70,000 Hebrews, his fellow people, to build and that wasn't enough. So he looked out over the land of Israel and he, what did he discover? There's lots of Gerim and he enslaved over 150,000 of the others, the outsiders. To get the temple built, he created a system of taxation and slavery that violated everything that God intended. And then he dares to pray a prayer dedicating this temple to God when the means by which the temple was built violated everything that God had built in to the web of creation. So you go read 2 Chronicles chapters 5 and 6. It is the strangest dedication prayer to a building you're ever going to find. When we, when we dedicate a new building at Whitworth, I'm the one who writes the prayer of dedication, and I'm the one who prays it. This is not a moment of celebration, as it is on your campuses or on ours, when the gift of a new building is open for 
to serve you as students. This is a prayer of confession. God cannot be contained in a, temp in a temple, and Solomon appeals for forgiveness. He repents in advance because he understands that he's violated Shalom, but it's too late. Israel's gone too far down the road. So during his 40 years of security and prosperity in the land, Solomon managed to devise a bureaucratic state built upon coercion in which free citizens were enslaved for state goals. Remarkably, in one generation, he managed to confiscate Israel's freedom and reduce social order to the very situation of Egyptian slavery. And Israel could not turn back. So when he dies, <clears throat> the elders step up and they go, we, we, we can't keep doing this. And his son steps up and he think, says, you think my dad was tough? Watch what I'm going to do to you. General Jeroboam steps up and says, we're done with you, Rehoboam. We're done with you. And Israel splits into two nations, south and north, over the issue of slavery. Let's see, I think that happened in another nation, didn't it? Over the same issue, because we violated, as God's people, God's creation intention for how we relate to each other. So from that point on, you have a division in the land. And it's at this point that the prophets rise up. Prophets have no political office. They have no backing. They simply have the compulsion of God's spirit to speak God's shalom into a broken society. That's all they've got. Most of them were murdered because they call for shalom. And here's the frequency of the terms. They call for shalom into a society that by now has become the exact antithesis of God's vision of shalom. This is dangerous business. And most of them were murdered. So, I want to take a look at a couple of prophetic passages with you. One of them is Jeremiah 29. The people have been marched into Babylonian exile. The false prophet Shemaiah in chapter 28 is saying, Shalom, Shalom, we're going to get out of Babylon in a couple of years. Jeremiah says, you're an absolute fool, Shemaiah. The only way you are going to survive in Babylonian captivity is to listen to me. And this is what Jeremiah says in chapter 29. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat produce. Marry and have children to the third generation. That's what's happening in my family right now. I get to see the third generation, and I'm 62 years old. You don't get to third generation unless a lot of time <laughs> passes by. Increase in number there and do not decrease. The Hebrew term has the same vision as Genesis 1.28. Care for the earth so that it becomes fruitful and multiplies. I want you to be fruitful and multiply in Babylonian exile. Seek the shalom of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for that city, for in their shalom you will also have your shalom. Bishop Tutu said this, there can be no shalom for some until there is shalom for all. That was the theological principle that led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. Now the TRC did not accomplish everything. I have good friends who live in South Africa. I had one at the table with me in September when we were talking about the TRC for a whole night. Incredible conversation. But it took the right step towards what Walter Brueggemann calls proximate shalom. We as humans can never recreate the perfection that God embedded in Genesis 1 and 2. What we can do is move towards proximate shalom. Because there's always something that's broken. There's always something that's not functioning according to God's intent. But we can, we can sure put ourselves on the road of that trajectory. Increase and multiply, be fruitful. Shalom your enemies. 
Let's see, didn't Jesus have something to say about that in the Sermon on the Mount? Where does Jesus get that? He gets it from Jeremiah. Shalom, your enemies. Now, how many of you either have quoted or have heard others quote Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to shalom you and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Whenever I hear a student at Whitworth quote that, I ask, do you know the context of that? Do you know where the people are? Do you know the conditions they're living in? Do you know the challenge of verse 11? Be very careful not to proof text. Always interpret, always listen to scripture in its original context. The plans are for a future and a hope to shalom you, but this is a slow train coming, 70 years. 586, they went into Babylonian captivity. 516, under the Persian emperor Cyrus, they start to come back. And if you read Nehemiah, what you'll discover is that very few of the third generation now living in Babylon, Babylon's their home for the third generation. They, third generation, they've heard about Jerusalem. That's not their home. Most of them stay. Babylon has now become their home. It became a place of shalom even while they were living under Babylonian oppression. The people flourished in Babylonian exile. Remarkable story. There's Jeremiah. There's shalom. Pretty crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. So, God wants shalom righteousness, God and humanity to be in right relationship with each other, even if that means right relationship with those who you have called enemies. One of Dr. King's famous statements, love is the only power that can turn an enemy into a friend. That's Jeremiah, that's Jesus. Shalom justice, transforming the way things are into the way things are meant to be. Dr. King's famous speech on the steps of the Capitol, 1963. In 2009, I led a group of students on a course called Prejudice Across America. We began in New York City, then we were in Atlanta for the King celebration weekend of his birthday, then went to D.C. We were on the mall for the inauguration of President Obama in 2009. I sat with a friend of mine. He grew up less than a mile from me, but there was a street that divided us in Chicago. We were divided by a street and by skin color. And we said to each other, if this day ever comes, we're going. And there we were on the steps of the Capitol locked arms as Obama took the oath of office. I'm not making a political statement here. What I want you to understand is that from the perspective of people from all over the world who came to D.C. in January 2009, they saw the miracle of Obama's election as a sign of healing for the world. And it was a moment of healing in my relationship with my friend Jimmy McGee. What we've been taught about Cicero Avenue dividing us was a lie in Chicago. And that day we were reminded of it. We sat near a, a very elderly and distinguished African-American couple. And there were TV cameras up all over the, the, the top of the monument because it had such a great view looking down the mall to the Capitol. And they kept getting interviewed. So f we were just curious who these people were. So finally we went over and started talking with them they're in that crowd that you see. They're actually on the steps of the memorial. They were there when King gave his speech. And they said, if this day ever comes, if God allows us and we have strength in our bodies, we're coming back. There they were, January 2009. We created a nation. We being, I'm talking about myself, the white male Anglos created a nation of exclusion and privilege and power. 
and we live with the effects of that, there are little breakthroughs of what the world could look like that's quite different. That was one of those days. So here's Isaiah's vision of Messiah. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. In Hebrew, the verb basar, that one Hebrew word captures that entire phrase that we need in English. Basar means to bring someone some good news. If you're going to bring somebody bad news, there's a different Hebrew term. When that gets translated into Greek, the Greek word oiangelizo gets used, from which we get our term evangelism. So let me paraphrase Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who proclaims the evangel, the gospel, the good news. Now here's the question. What's the content of the announcement? Three components. Don't ignore any of them. If you pull any of those components out, we do not have gospel. Who proclaims shalom, content point number one. Who proclaims salvation, <coughs> Hebrew term Yeshua, which, by the way, interestingly, becomes the Hebrew name for Jesus. Literally, God saves. Jesus gets his name from Isaiah 52, 7. Your God reigns, Hebrew Malach. A stool needs to have th at least three legs on it to hold up the weight of your body. You can put more legs on it, but you have to have at least three. If you don't have three legs on a stool, it's going to be dangerous. If we eliminate any of the elements of Isaiah's good news, we are not proclaiming gospel, and that is dangerous. Because then we presume that we can truncate and shrink the incredible vision of God's gospel into what we want it to be. The kingdom of God, God's reign, is one leg. God's salvation is a second leg. So the question then becomes, what does salvation mean? I commend to you another book. Salvation means creation healed. Okay. Shua in Hebrew means to make whole, to set things right, to restore to the way they were originally intended by God. Sozo in Greek means exactly the same thing. So salvation is about God's intervention in the broken creation to reestablish God's reign and God's rule, just like Genesis 1 and 2, in order to make things right. And when God re-enters the world to make things right, salvation, what's the outcome? Shalom. No wonder Isaiah says it's about all three. To emphasize any one of these three at the exclusion of the others is a mistake. Every one of these elements is gospel, but you don't have the full gospel, the complete gospel, until you have all three. So, turn to, we, we don't, I, I, I won't put this up here now, but Isaiah, the very next chapter, I do not like chapter and verse divisions in scripture because it distorts the thinking of the writers. When you write an extended email to somebody, you're not thinking somebody's going to chop that up into chapter and verse divisions, right? It's a flow of thought. So Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one who brings good news. Who proclaims the kingdom of God, God's reign. Who declares God wants to intervene to restore things to their original order. Shall, uh, salvation, who wants to bring shalom. And then a few verses later, Isaiah starts to talk about the suffering servant. Now, if you have your Bibles, either in electronic or written form, turn to Isaiah 53, 5, please, for one moment. Isaiah 
Isaiah 53 and verse 5. You have it? Yeah. You, you go ahead and read it. What, and tell us what translation. It's in the ESV. Okay, that's the English Standard Version. Go ahead. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And okay, stop right there. Upon us was the chastisement that brought us peace. That's the English Standard Version. What do you have? What um, version? Starting in 5. Yep. Um, I don't know what the, I think oh. it's NIV. Oh, yeah, it's NIV. Okay, go ahead and read it. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Okay. <laughs> the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we were healed. You know what the Hebrew term is? Shalom. <coughs> the outcome for the prophet Isaiah of the suffering of the unnamed servant is to bring shalom. Well, that makes sense. It's exactly what the prophet has just said back in 52.7, isn't it? So when we talk about the results of what God is up to in Christ redeeming the world, we'd better listen to what the scriptures say is the outcome of that. Isaiah 53, 5, that gets read every Good Friday in the Presbyterian church that I worship in. We read that. Do we understand the full implications of it? Or is salvation in our minds something less than that? We spent a long time in the Old Testament, and here's why. Because when we get to the Gospels, here's what we discover. When Jesus shows up, he is about resetting all of creation's intention in Genesis 1 and 2. More, about, more miracles in Mark than any other theme. 18 miracles in Mark. What are the miracles? Jesus is resetting creation order. Luke's gospel. All the incredible people that get included in Luke. There's more about women in Luke's gospel than all the other gospels combined. There's more about Gideon, the outsiders. And that makes sense because Luke's a Gentile, right? He's asking the question all the way through, do I belong to? Because when you read the book of Acts, there were some people who was telling his buddy Paul, not that guy. He can't be included because he's a Gentile. So how far does the gospel go? Of course Luke's focused on relationships. Because he's being told, you're a Gideon, and you won't get in the community of Jesus because of your ethnicity. And they start listening to the stories and going, well, wow, Jesus was pretty inclusive. <clears throat> like when James and John want to call down fire from heaven. In Luke chapter 9, I preached about that in chapel on Wednesday morning here. You know what Jesus did? He rebuked them for that idea. You know what the term rebuke means? To cast out a demon. To think that privilege and power and prejudice justifies a prayer meeting of divine incineration? Jesus calls that demonic. I travel with 20 faculty from Christian universities, from some of your schools in August, and we went to the place where humans have called down fire upon each other. We were at Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the anniversaries of the detonations. And over 12 days, we sat and listened to about 30 Hibakusha survivors, many of them of Christian faith. And I know all the political arguments. My dad was, was training for the invasion of Japan. I know all the political stuff. But when you go into the place where literally we humans have fired each other from heaven and thought that God was on our side, the pilots of both planes were Catholic. The chaplains who prayed the prayer of blessing on the bombs were Catholic. The largest cathedral in all of Asia in 1945 was in the Urakami region of the city of Nagasaki, and it got blown right off the hill at the detonation. We sat and listened and spent a day with the Catholic Archbishop who was in his mother's womb on August 9, 1945. He was born into a world that had been torched. 
No wonder Luke is asking the question, do I belong? Because even the followers of Jesus had, were convinced some people didn't belong, and Jesus had a really wide reach. Matthew, we get five great elements of teaching, the five wonderful teaching blocks, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount, where we are being retaught what shalom stewardship responsibility looks like. We need to listen to those texts to know how we can be responsible stewards. And then in John's Gospel, we have this incredible expression of John, of God's beauty. So, John 1.14, the Word became flesh, and lived among us, and we beheld the glory of God. Glory for John is the equivalent of the word beauty. Full of grace and full of truth. That's how beauty gets expressed in John's gospel. Full of grace and full of truth. Now we just saw that the gospel from Isaiah's perspective has the components of shalom in it, right? Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. In all, and you take these courses, you read these books, I know, I know, what you, I know what's going on at your schools because it's going on at our school. There's a constant conversation about how do we understand the, the atonement of, of Jesus, the, the saving death of Jesus? How do, we, how do we view that? Let's just listen to Jesus for a moment before we start telling him what we think was going on at the cross. Hours before he was betrayed, he's with his closest friends, and in John 14, 27, he says this, my shalom I give you, my shalom I leave you, not as the world gives, don't be afraid. 14, 27, two times shalom. 16, 33, the last thing he says before he prays, in the world, you're gonna find trouble, but in me, you will have shalom, a third utterance of shalom. After he's raised from the dead, John chapter 20, verses 19 and 21, on resurrection night, he steps into the room where the disciples are terrified. The Sanhedrin's gonna come and get them and murder them too. He steps in the room, shalom, verse 19, shalom, verse 21. And then when he, when he comes before Thomas, a week later, the first word he says to Thomas is shalom. Three times, just prior to his crucifixion, Jesus says, you wanna know what I'm about? I'm about shalom. And three times after he's raised from the dead, the first word he utters to his closest friends, shalom. I think Jesus it, it understands what he goes through in his suffering and his death, and then in his resurrection, as the reestablishment of God's shalom if we take his own word seriously and we don't impose our ideas. So, in the last minute then, here's the struggle. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna leap ahead here. Sorry, I got to preaching, I apologize. So here's the struggle. We are all marked by the sociological categories of gender, race, and class. And when we come to the book of Acts, we should not be surprised that those issues come to the forefront. The book of Acts is about three things. Proclamation, kerygma, koinonia, fellowship or community, and diakonia, service. Those three elements, according to Pedrito Maynard Reed, a Haitian the Christian theologian who's written this wonderful book called Complete Evangelism, are needed to integrate evangelism's shalom. This afternoon, if you want to come back, we're going to do, we're going to do this. We're going to do a case study in the book of Acts. And I'm calling it the book of Acts, a case study in the church's struggle to develop intercultural competence for the sake of shalom. Because in the book of Acts, gender, class, and ethnicity, the early church keeps bumping up against those three things. And the Spirit of God keeps 
pushing them through the barriers that have been created by the categories of culture. This is not easy work. But the early church had to deal with it immediately in the first generation after Jesus, and we're dealing with, with it now. Now, one final statement, then you can do your evaluations. If you fast forward to the book of Revelation, we just did the book of Revelation with all the worship leaders yesterday afternoon. You're going to find in the book of Revelation seven worship services. Read through those seven worship services. In those worship services, we are being given the lyrics to the songs that they are singing. And here's what we discover. In those seven worship services, God is described as creator, therefore worthy of worship, redeemer, therefore worthy of worship, provider, therefore worthy of worship, healer, restorer, king, the source of judgment, the one who celebrates with us, and in the end, the one who heals us. Not just us individually, Revelation 21, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, but also heals all the brokenness that we have between peoples, Revelation 22. And the leaves of the tree of life, that term has not showed up since Genesis chapter three. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, the ethnicities, the peoples. In the end, what God intends is the restoration and the healing of all of God's good creation. And you can see that in the seven worship services in the book of Revelation. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.